This is The Competitive Edge with Ben Altman. Welcome to The Competitive Edge. My name is Scott Burton and I'm here to help you answer a question that we all have. How can I get an edge in my business and life? Each week we're going to uncover how some of the most successful and inspiring entrepreneurs, entertainers, and thought leaders get an edge so you too can reach your full potential. Do you want more unique ideas and tactics like the ones we're about to share in this episode? Then you're going to want to do two things. The first is to subscribe to the Competitive Edge on iTunes so that you don't miss out on new ideas from future conversations. After this, you're going to want to go check out my main site, lifelonglearner.com. When you enter in your email address to join the Lifelong Learner community, you'll get access to my most advanced strategies to stack the deck in your favor. Again, that's life longlearner Com. Today is a day I've been excited for since I started this show. You see, for a long time, I was what I call unconsciously competent when it came to interacting with people. I usually made a good impression and had no trouble making friends or connections, but I wasn't acutely aware of the things that I was doing that made interactions go well so that I could call upon these tools and behaviors to replicate my results in any situation. That's until I met one of my best friends and today's guest on the show, Ben Altman. Ben is an amazing guy and one of the founders of Charisma On Command. You might remember him from episode one where he interviewed yours truly on my life story. When it comes to the art of people, few people know more than Ben. And he's not one of these guys that just teaches concepts on how to improve your ability with people, but doesn't actually have skills. He is the living embodiment of how to win friends and influence people And I know this firsthand. I mean, he's the guy that convinced me to leave New York City and move to Brazil with him for a year, which I'm super happy that he did. Today, he's going to come on the show and share how to make an amazing first impression. Whether we're talking about that big interview, meeting contacts at professional events, or talking to that cute friend of a friend you meet at a party, this conversation is loaded with actionable tips to leave the person you're speaking with wanting to spend more time with you and excited to help you. And who doesn't want to be that guy or girl? His method is tried and true, and I even now implore in my own life, and trust me, these concepts really work. So you're going to want to pay close attention to everything he says. Let's learn how to make a killer first impression with one of my best buds, Ben Altman. Ben, what's up, dude? Hey, how's it going, brother? Good. It's fun to turn the tables as the first time we talked in this podcast, you were interviewing me. So it's an honor and a pleasure to have you on here, my friend. Yeah, I'm excited to be back. Ben, so today we're going to talk about a topic that I certainly cannot get enough of. I know a lot of people are interested in, and it's something that you have insane expertise in, and that's how do you make a great first impression? I know this is a question you get asked a lot, And maybe we could just talk a little bit and really open this up by just outlining the different components and variables at play that are important to making an excellent first impression. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'll say this is probably one of not the most common questions I get asked. So definitely, I think we've all had that experience where like you go and whether it's a networking event or someone at a bar or a friend of a friend, you meet someone and then you see them again. And you walk up, you're like, oh, hey, what's up? And they don't remember who you are. And it's just terrible, right? It's like an awful feeling to have. So I think the uh, the impetus of like, why does that occur? It's not because anything is wrong with you as a person. It's just presentation skills, right? Because people don't really know like what goes into making the kind of impression that leaves people going like, wow, I want to work with that guy. Or like, wow, I have to see that guy again. So right. that's kind of what we've done is just like broken down what is the actual system when you look at the best people in the world at this, like what are they doing consistently that leaves people wanting to interact with them again? Conversely. And we've all encountered that person too, who like you meet the guy and you're like, holy moly, I want that dude in my life. Or I want that girl in my life. She's amazing. She's awesome. When's the next time she's going to be around and how can I get there? And I think that's the place that everybody wants to be. And that's what we're going to learn about today. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and that stuff is awesome. Like I, I've had job interviews where afterwards the guy was like, I knew before you sat down in the chair that I was going to say we should hire you. And that's just like a superpower. That's just an amazing thing to be able to do. 
So it's uh, it's like a huge part of my my own life benefit in terms of mastering this stuff has definitely been being able to do it just quickly in the few minutes you have with someone, being able to leave them with a strong impression that lasts. Right. And you know, I'm, I'm sitting here, dude, and I'm looking at your, your handsome photo on Skype <laughs> uh, with the deep V-neck and the chest muscles and all that. Just so everybody knows, this is something that you weren't always good at. And this yes. is a skill that can be developed, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my it's so funny because when you're good at anything, everybody assumes it was easy for you. This isn't true of just charisma. It's true of, of anything. That's like what being good at something looks like. It looks effortless. But uh, yeah, I started not from a terrible place, but just very much a normal guy. Like did okay in recruiting, was like decent at socializing. I wasn't the president of anything in school. So like it definitely was something I took concerted focus and effort on getting better at. And I would say it's awesome because unlike being a concert level pianist, that takes maybe 20 years before you're, you're at the point where you're like, oh, wow, I'm like one of the best at this ever. You can, if you focus on your ability with people, you can get so good so fast. And I think that that combined with just like the tangible benefits I was seeing is kind of what made me get so into this, whatever it was, seven years ago when I started down this road. Yeah. And it's also, you know, to borrow a term from business, it's insanely scalable, right? Yeah. Whether we're talking about finding your perfect match or recruiting a business partner or selling a product or just building an awesome wolf pack of friends, like it's all these skills are all insanely valuable and it's which makes it such a high leverage investment of your time. Totally. Yeah. And the and the way we teach all this stuff too, like how you make a good first impression on the CEO you're trying to get to hire you is the same as how you would try to get somebody in a bar to like you. Like it's not that there's this like crazy bag of tactics that you need to get into. Like people are people and it's the same, you know, four or five things that you really need to do to make an incredible lasting impression on anybody, no matter who they are. All right, dude. So let's, uh, let's dive in. I mean, I think we've done a good job selling it. <laughs> now, <laughs> now it's time to deliver the pretty boat package. Um, so what are the, what are the four or five things? Where do we start with this? What do we need to be thinking about? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we can uh, we can kind of dive in wherever you want in terms of where the like ingredients go. But the way I think about it is there's really like four parts. I guess five parts if you count like starting the conversation. So like saying words, I guess would be step one. Mm -hmm. And then there's really just four emotions that you need to create in anybody that's going to get them to remember you and like you and want to see you. And the first impression, it's all about feelings. It's all about the feelings you create in the other person. The story behind it, like who you are, what you do, that is just a useful mechanism to communicate to the other person. But ultimately, it's about generating these feelings. And those are very simply and quickly, just positive feelings of fun, happiness, then trust, respect, and then at the end, making them feel special. And that's it. If you can walk up to someone and within 30 seconds, they just feel better because you're there than before you were there. And then you can get them to show them that you're trustworthy, you're someone that they should want to talk to. Then you do what you have to to get them to respect you as a person. And then last, now that you're someone they like, trust, and respect, you make them feel good. It doesn't matter who they are. That is a formula that just makes people want to have you around and be around and remember you when you're gone. And there's, I mean, obviously within each bucket, there are things you have to do to do that. But that's really the, at a basic level, it's that kind of sequence of emotions, positive feelings, trust, respect, and then just making them feel special and good about who they are. I really like that because it brings intention to the interaction. Whereas a lot of times it's like, okay, walking into a room, hope this guy thinks I'm cool afterwards. Yeah. Instead of just being like, okay, you know, if I want this person to like me and help me or want to be around me or whatever the objective is not to, not to say that every interaction requires an objective, but I mean, let's be real here. Like, usually we want something to happen when we start talking to somebody. Yeah, my, it's, uh, my goal is to elicit these emotions. Yeah, and it's really, honestly, it's not very mechanical. Like, when you go into the different things that make up each section, it's not like you're going to be sitting there with a checklist of 100 things. A lot of these things, you have to make them unconscious habits. You have to become unconsciously competent at it. Because, you know, positive feelings, that's a matter of two minutes. Uh, trust that can take literally like a 10th of a second 
there's there's body language things that go into this there's the way you say how you say it it's not about having like this huge algorithm of things it's literally just being like okay like i know i have to do four things i have to make this person have fun or be happy somehow feel positive and i have to make sure that they see that i'm someone they can trust and then have them respect me and then make sure that they feel good and like you'll be able to just pull up within three minutes of any conversation and be like where am i weak in these four areas right now focus on that and as long as you just do that within the span of a couple minutes you're into like a deep instant connection with somebody and that's when you can get really substantive after you both have been like wow i really like this person and you kind of agree together to go deeper or go longer right so it's not going to be that within three minutes you're going to get the job offer it's going to be that within three minutes the guy says wow like this guy is different than all the other people i've met and then you talk more about other stuff right same with dating you're not going to propose three minutes in but it's the first three minutes to get whoever you're talking to to go wow like I really want to talk to this person more. So it's not super mechanical, like positive feeling, for instance, the first bucket, you just do that with a smile. You do that literally with a smile on your face and in your eyes. And you just come in just exuding positivity with your body language and with your energy. And that's really it for that. There's no like magic sentence to make the other person feel good. It's just about walking up, being high energy, using your body, to kind of be in motion and gesticulate and smile with your eyes and smile with your mouth. When you say hello and walk up and instead of saying, oh, hi, what's up, I'm Ben. Just be like, oh, what's going on, I'm Ben, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And just immediately coming in, feeling good. The emotions are contagious. We all have mirror neurons, we feed off each other. They'll right away just start coming to where you are. And that's really like the 80-20 of the first part, just creating that positive emotion in somebody, it's that easy. Got it. So you walk into a networking event or a conference or wherever people are going to meet somebody. And the goal is, is just smile big, be happy. And in terms of like, is there anything that we should be doing? Cause I, I, I like read stuff where it's like people make a judgment, people make a judgment and thin slice you before you even come up and talk to them. Yep. I mean, do we have to be consciously aware of that? Totally. So there's a couple things. This isn't true of stage comedians so i'll say that first everyone i say this rule and then they're like well there's all sorts of grumpy comedians that make people laugh and smile when you're not on stage and people haven't paid a hundred dollars to hear what you have to say you can't be unhappy and create positive emotions in people so like if you walk into a networking event and you're stressed and you're you, whatever it is and you walk up you see the ceo of the guy that's gonna make the hiring decision you go over and you go oh heads i really like your company i I would be so honored to talk to you for just two minutes of your time. And you go monotone and you don't smile and you're low energy. He is going to just want to get away from you as quickly as possible, right? So it's before you even walk up and approach, it's about in yourself having high energy and a smile and feeling good. And the, the simplest way to do that is just to be in motion. So before you ever get into the bar, if you're trying to talk to someone, or the networking event, if you're trying to get a job or you're trying to hire people, you just, in your own body, stand up straight, assume good body language, this bleeds into trust too, and then start talking to everyone and start building your social momentum and start smiling to yourself and just have conversations with everyone around you till you start to feel loose in your body. Because I, I think uh, Charlie might have touched on this when he spoke, but so much of how you feel comes from your body and your body language. So getting loose and getting talking and starting to talk with people that you might not be trying to like, quote unquote, make a good impression on, but just getting yourself feeling good will make it so that when you do see someone that you're really interested in making a good impression on, you can roll right up from that social momentum, smile, have the energy, and before you even open your mouth, he'll see it in your eyes, he'll see it in the musculature of your face. We're very good at reading each other as humans. And right away, that tension in your face or not, you can't fake it by going muscle by muscle in your face, but you can start to feel good by talking to other people, smiling, go do jumping jacks in the bathroom if you have to, and then come up and with energy and with vocal tonality that conveys energy, walk up and say, hey, I don't think I met you yet, I'm Ben. And that just comes across infinitely differently than if you were to do it with a frown, with your shoulders slunched quietly. Right. I mean, I think I, I love this and, 
you know, for me, it's, it's so apparent and I have to credit you for learning me or teaching me this. It's, you know, it's really about just building state and seeking the opportunity, seeking the actions and opportunities prior to entering a situation where we want to come off like just in complete flow. Uh, whether that be like talking to the cab driver or being nice to the front people at the front desk and being in- inquisitive about their lives. These are all just opportunities for you to just get in flow. And Absolutely. so by the time you get to that place, like you're already loose, you're already warm, you're ready to go, you're smiling, you have mo- you've built the momentum as you've outlined. Like it's yeah. that, that you have to be aware of that in order to, to, to reach that place where you're going to make the best impression on this person. Yeah. There's, there's no way that you can just come in, in a crappy state and then make a good impression. Like this isn't anything we're inventing. That's new. If you reverse engineer any conversations that you've had that went really well, even if you went in low energy, you went in not feeling good. At some point in the conversation, I would guarantee that you started to come out of that state into a positive, happy one. And when you walked away, you both walked away feeling good. There's no way you walk in grumpy. Neither of you feels good about the interaction. You walk away and that guy or girl goes, oh, I really want to hire that person. Or, oh, I really want to date that person. So we're not like inventing anything new here. We're just saying this is what all good impressions look like. Let's do it on purpose. And so we reverse engineered it. And you're better off going in feeling positive with a smile on your face, with energy, and just making eye contact as you shake hands than you are going in in a low state and trying to break out of it mid-conversation. Awesome. Now, I know that there's also like the extreme of this that's important to be aware of. Like some people come in, but they're trying to blow the roof off the place and it might like (laughs) freak people out. Maybe you could speak a little bit to just the calibration involved here. For sure. I mean, so again, the point of this is not act happy. The point is create positive feelings in the other person. And so depending on the situation, how you do that is very different, right? If you walk into a very stern, severe interview environment and you just start cracking really inappropriate jokes, you might lose the job because of that, right? But you can still walk in and smile and be just a little bit higher energy than all the other people in the room. And I mean, you walk in, let's say, to a board meeting, right? Very not necessarily goofy, fun, like a bar situation. And you're a speaker, you're a guest advisor or something. You walk in, you have a very quick amount of time to build a positive emotional experience, trust and respect all at once, right? And I know we'll talk about trust and respect after this, but in terms of positive feelings, That is going to be walking in there and carrying yourself in a way that people like. Now, if you're there to ream them for what they're doing poorly, maybe that's not jokes, but it is going to be high energy, right? You're going to walk in with conviction. Think like uh, Martin Luther King as a speaker, right? Not necessarily happy, but still coming in with a lot of energy, right? And what that does as a listener is you immediately buy into his story. So it's a little bit different, but even in those extremely stern situations, you can do it. But you do want to make sure you're not like a dancing monkey trying really hard to please everybody. Now, in like a bar or club or something social, you actually can come in really happy. It's like honestly totally fine to be happy when you're out socializing. Uh, The difference is just remember it's not about you being as wacky and high energy as possible. It's about just being aware that the other person, whatever you need to do to get that person feeling positively about you, which generally at any sort of networking event, at any sort of interview, at any sort of date or bar is going to involve a smile and it's going to involve using your body to gesticulate when you talk and be in motion, not just so you come off like a commanding person, but also so that you feel good because you can't feel confident if your hands are deep in your pockets, your shoulders are slumped and you're all tight. So the motion is as much for yourself as it is for the people you're talking to. I have a very specific instance in my mind that I'd love your feedback on. So you go to you go to an event and you see a group of people standing in the circle. The person that you want to talk to is in that circle. You want to meet them, but you don't you're weary of like just completely interrupting a conversation. What what do you what do you advise people do in that instance? Yeah, so this is going to have to bleed into the other areas, right? Cuz it's it's more than just be smiling, right? But you honestly, you walk up, you would walk up smiling, you'd try to wait for a lull where you could go just introduce yourself to all the people in the circle potentially. But it's really, I mean, for that instance, it's about walking up 
with a smile, with big body language, take up space in the circle, not in an obnoxious way, but just so that you don't look like you're sorry that you're there. And then you're going to have to wait until it's your opportunity to start to interact. And then it's about building trust, building respect. That's kind of the parts where in that situation, it's really going to be who separates themselves from the rest of the pack. Does that make sense? Absolutely. How can people practice this if they're like not constantly going out so that when the time comes, they're ready to rock? Yeah. So in terms of the first part, which is really all we're on right now, which yep. is like state control, I would say the best thing you can do is just recognize that how you feel is so in your control. And it's really just based on your body language, what you're focused on and the words you're saying. So if you're going to like this networking event, right? And let's say you don't want to go practice a hundred handshakes or whatever it is. All you can do that's really simple, but like really, really helpful is one, just look in the mirror and smile and just get used to smiling and look at yourself when you are smiling. Are you smiling with your eyes? Get a sense for what that feels like. Because when you have a genuine smile, it's not just gritting your teeth, right? It, it's through your whole face. And then in terms of when you walk in, just practice getting yourself feeling good all the time. Honestly, this is a good life habit anyway. Just stand the way you stand when you're happy and confident. And when you hear your internal dialogue, like focus specifically on how well it's going to go. Be like, what's going to happen if this goes well? Why would this go well? Why am I an awesome candidate or an awesome person to date or an awesome job applicant, whatever it is. And just between your body language and your focus, start to get yourself feel really, really good. Smile in the mirror. Notice when your smile is natural. Then just walk away from it. 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, do it again. You'll get really good at just practicing, putting yourself into that mode by doing it. The other thing is people always ask, like, how can I turn it on on command? That, that's why we're called Charisma On Command, right? But the truth is you can't live your entire life as one person and then in these one-off 1% 1 of your waking hour moments, feel really good and confident and then come off amazingly. So if you want to get good at making a first impression on people that, that are important to you, get good at making a first impression on everyone. So when you go to buy coffee or you go to get your food or you have a waiter or a waitress or you're on a bus standing next to someone you don't know, smile, say hello, try to crack a joke. Just get used to creating conversations with people you don't know and just conveying positive energy to them and to see if they mirror you. If they smile back, if they say hello in a way that makes it seem like they are like pleasantly pleased with your interaction, then you're doing it right. If you walk in, you're like, oh, hello, and they give you the stink eye, maybe they're just in a bad mood, try again. If you try 10 times and everyone's giving you the stink eye, go back to the mirror, figure out what, what is it about your body language or your face that's giving them the impression that something is incongruent. Because the truth is when you come in happy and smiling in your day to day, almost everybody smiles back at you. Yeah, totally. The world's your training ground and you got to recalibrate, readjust if you're getting 10 stinky eyes in a row. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, nobody wants that much stinky eyes. It's a lot of stinky eyes. Um, so, okay. So, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about the trust part because I think yeah. this is critical and I'm really interested to see how you suggest people go about doing this. Totally. So there's, I guess there's two parts. The first part is in the first, to your point, it's Blink, it's Malcolm Gladwell. It's the first tenth of a second of, should I trust this guy? And that is all nonverbal. So one is eye contact. It's looking the person in the eye when you speak and when they speak. People are really good at making eye contact when the other person is speaking. And then when mm. they start to talk, they look down or they look away. And that is like a signal that you're uncomfortable, which either means that you're dishonest or you're just uncomfortable with the situation in whatever social context it is. Either way, it's not good, right? So one is eye contact, really important. Two is open body language. So if you walk in and you're meeting someone for the first time and your arms are crossed, your hands are in your pockets, your head is down, your legs are crossed, right? That's not what a charismatic person looks like. That's not the kind of person that walks in and immediately engages people. And people know this intuitively. If I ask you know, everyone listening, think about someone anyone, guy or girl, doesn't even have to be a real person, just walking into a circle and within minutes having every eye on them. What is that person doing? How are they standing? They're standing up straight. Their head is up. They're making eye contact. They're gesticulating. People know this, but until you're, you have it like brought to the forefront of your brain, we don't model it. We just see people doing it. We go, oh, they're really charismatic. And we don't ask what are they doing that we're not doing. And then the third thing is touch really like mm. not at all meant to be invasive, but it's just as simple as when you meet someone, 
don't do that weird thing where you walk into a circle. I see this all the time in like bars or parties. People will like walk into a circle that they weren't in before and there'll be people that they don't know. And they'll be like, oh, this is Scott. Scott, these are my friends, you know, Justin, Ben, Charlie, whatever. And there's like this awkward like half wave thing from the hip kind of. And then you just stand there. And that is just not a great way to make a strong impression. Versus walking in, it can be a handshake, be a hand on the shoulder, can be like a very brief little man hug. Uh, touch is huge for building trust because it just shows that like you can interact with each other. You're not a physical threat to each other. It dates back to like primal evolutionary science, but it's a huge part of it. So it's literally walking in, eye contact, bodies open. You meet someone, you shake their hand, you look them in the eye. Maybe you put your second hand on their elbow or their shoulder. You're halfway there. Like now you have a great first part of the first impression. You're smiling. You've got the energy. The second thing that builds trust is in the actual conversation, there's two things. Can I stop you real quick? Sure. You know, it's interesting. I'm just reflecting on my own uh, life experience here. And it's like, there's such a difference in terms of how I feel about a dude when I first meet him or introduce him. And there's like just the straight handshake. And then there's like the handshake where we like then bring it in for a bro hug. Like <laughs> the bro hug, the just that additional shoulder pat. I'm like, oh man, this guy's cool. Like this guy's my boy. I like this guy. And then the, this, and it, you know, this is not appropriate for every situation, obviously. But then there's the person that, you know, comes and gives me that hug. I feel close to them. The same goes with like the, the girl that I meet at a bar. It's like, or wherever it is, it's like, you know, there's, uh, a handshake that's all formal and then there's like oh come here like give me a hug and i'm like oh my gosh this person's so nice and cool and whatever whatever other emotions are there like it's so yeah. interesting and th they don't say anything different right it's all body totally and the other thing is context is huge right so but the point is this if you're in an informal context meeting friends don't give a stiff handshake give at least the handshake and the hand on the shoulder right if you're being introduced to like somebody's fiance, like your best friend's fiance, give her a hug. <laughs> if you're at a very formal business thing, shake the person's hand, right? You're meeting the CEO and she is like, oh, nice to meet you. I'm Sarah. You're like, I'm Scott. Shake her hand, right? She's a CEO. You wouldn't give her a big hug necessarily, but you just want to be whatever is like one step further than what you necessarily could do in terms of physical touch. It's not meant to be encroaching. It's not lingering, but it does immediately it assumes familiarity and it builds familiarity. Mm, that's good, man. So let's talk about the verbal stuff. Yeah. So verbally, I mean, there's really two ways to do it. And it's not necessarily about forcing these, although you can so much as not hiding from these. And again, this is about building trust, right? Not building respect necessarily. So one is revealing flaws and these aren't, these can't, these don't have to be like huge things. These don't have to be like deep, deep things that you normally keep hidden and you're like, oh, Ben said to reveal flaws. So here I'm going to like air a half hour of dirty laundry and psychoses at people. It just means you go to the networking event and someone's like, oh, like, nice to meet you. Like, who are you here with? Who do you know? And you just go, uh, honestly, I don't know anybody. here. Like I'm all alone <laughs> and just <laughs> making a joke about it and owning it instead of being like, oh, well, you know, I got invited because I'm in this and I, I belong here. You know, it's just being like, I, I don't know. I really don't know how I ended up here, but like, I'm excited about it. If that's true, owning it does a huge job of building trust. And the second thing is just being honest about when you disagree. So again, this isn't like make up a time you disagree or like try to pick fights, but a really good way to build trust is to just when you disagree with someone, voice it politely, totally not offensively, but just getting it out there that like you stand up for what you believe and also you don't hide from conflict or confrontation means that when you do agree with someone or whatever you say, people will trust that what you're saying is genuine. It's like the person that you're friends with that no matter what you wear says you have a great outfit on or like every day she's like, Oh, I love your hair. I love your hair. I love your hair. I love your hair. Like you don't trust that guy. Right. But if you've got a friend that, you know, actually will give you real feedback on your actions or the way you dress or something you've said, so you'll say something, he'll go, Whoa, dude, that's not cool. Like easy on that. You know that you can rely on that guy to tell you what he thinks. And that immediately makes you trust him. Even if in that moment, it's like a little bit of a confrontation over the long term. And by long term, I mean, literally like the next five minutes of that conversation, you know that when he does agree or whatever he or she does say that it's legit, right? So 
again, if you walk in, you look people in the eye, you have open body language, you have touch, and then you are upfront with your flaws and you're upfront when you disagree, that oh, immediately, that combination of things does a, a very powerful job of making people go, wow, like this guy is real. Because inauthenticity is a really big turnoff. And I don't just mean that in the dating context. I mean, if you're interviewing someone or you're meeting someone that you could partner with on a business and you get the sense that they're not real with you, then you can't trust them. If you can't trust them, you will not want anything to do with them. But if somebody stands up for something they believe in, there's a really good chance that you'll go, wow, that's somebody that I like know I could take to bat with me because they'll be honest. Does that make sense? Yeah, I love, I always think of the example of people going to events and just being like, oh, how's your company doing? Or how's your business? And it's just like, oh, we're killing it. We're crushing it. And <laughs> it's like, most of those people aren't actually killing it. <laughs> and they'd be like so much better served if they were just like, yeah, you know, man, like this, this whole entrepreneurship thing is tough. Like we're trying our best and we're making progress, but man, like this is a, this is a haul. And yeah. I just don't see people do that. It's like, everybody wants to be Teflon Don. Yeah. My, my, I think back to my first ever event, uh, you know, 30 person thing, Breckenridge, Colorado, you were there. Uh, I was way over my head in terms of experience with entrepreneurship. There were people that had been there they were working on these businesses for such a long time. They were making millions of dollars, right? And I walk in and like, I don't know, end of the first day or something. I remember one of the guys hosting, it's like, oh, how are you feeling? And I could have been like, oh, it's awesome. It's, you know, I, I'm loving everybody and this and that. But I was like, honestly, like I feel a bit over my head. Like I'm just trying to sprint to keep up and it's great. I'm learning a lot, but like, it's definitely a lot. And he immediately, you could see, like, respected me for being vulnerable like that. And he knows going forward that, like, whatever he asks me when I answer it, he will believe me, right? So we've kind of bled into respect, too, because there's a bit of being the first to crack a joke, being the first to go vulnerable that builds respect also. But it's just, like, it's true. You're owning it. You're not ashamed of it. People see that, and they respect that, and they trust that. Yeah. I, I'm curious to get like your take on like how to elegantly disagree with somebody because I was in an interaction yesterday where this, we're having, we're having lunch at this place and this guy gets introduced to me and he's like super interested in, um, fitness and all this stuff. And he was on the biggest loser and he lost like 200 pounds. And he basically was just like prescribing, uh, what he believes is like the way for guys to get in bet in the best shape. And, with complete, I asked him like, you, you know, I'm all interested. I'm very interested in epigenetics and hormones and how all that stuff can affect the way that our bodies react to stimulus, like working out. And I'm like, you know, have you ever, have you ever like looked into how hormonal health affects people's ability to get in shape? And he's like, no, nah, you know, you know, it's like not important at all. Like whatever. And I was like, well, you know, actually here's my testimony. And then like, there was this like weird rift between us where he it was just awkward um and i'm just I, I think that a lot of people really have just a natural tendency to be a people pleaser and not to stand up for what they believe in mm -hmm. for fear of a situation like this where this person all of a sudden feels farther for me and i'm just kind of curious so like maybe you could give a very concrete example of a time when you disagreed with what somebody said and you were able to make that actually a positive for you yeah, for sure. So like in that example, for instance, uh, I would say one, it depends on how you're doing on the first stuff because it is sequential, right? So like the first part is the positive feelings, the smile, the eye contact, the body language, the energy, the touch, right? So there should be like a bit of positive feeling between you all. Uh, but the second thing is it's not about not disagreeing. It's just about how you position it, right? So for instance, he says, He's in this, you say a hormonal. He's like, oh no, I don't believe in that. There's, you could go like, well, you're an idiot because it's way more important than the stuff you're talking about. You dummy. Like that's not what I'm suggesting. Uh, and that will create a rift. I'm sure that's not what you did, but that's like the characterization of how not to do it. But if you just, you know, so he's like, oh, like, I don't think hormones matter at all. It's like, oh dude, you should check out this book, Engineering the Alpha. Or like, oh dude, you should check out this blog, blah, blah, blah. Like, I actually have gotten into hormonal stuff and it's been hugely beneficial for me. Like you might, you might love it. 
And then if he's going to get more aggressive, so most likely what is he going to do? He's going to go, oh, okay, cool. I'll check it out. And like, it's fine. If he's going to be like, no, that stuff is like quackery. You'd be like, actually, like, I'm just one guy, but my testosterone went up basically 50% in like two months. And all I did was change my diet. And I've done it with some friends and they had the same thing. And if he's, if he's going to just keep aggressively coming after you, you just dig your heels in more, so to speak. But it starts basically with very friendly, not at all confrontational. And then if you're pushed and he gets really aggressive, then you can just take a stand and be like, I mean, this is assuming he's like yelling at you for disagreeing with him, right? You'd be like, listen, right. dude. I mean, I at that point, the dude probably sucks anyways. You don't want him in your life. Yeah, but it also matters for the people around him, right? So like, let's say this is happening amongst a group of 10 people. Like the guy who bites his tongue might not make a bad impression on anybody, but he's not going to make a good impression on anybody. The guy who says, oh, really, man, like you should check out hormonal stuff. He goes, no, that's just quack. You go, dude, actually, like you should check out Engineering Alpha if you like fitness stuff. It's amazing. I don't get an affiliate commission for that book, by the way. I just like it. But uh, it was like, it's amazing. And then I tried it. My testosterone went up 50%. I did it with my friends. And he's like, dude, you're fucking, you know, full of shit. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this podcast, but you're, uh, <laughs> you can edit that. You're like totally wrong. You'd be like, dude, uh, like you should do the research before you get aggressive with someone. Cause I'm telling you I've done it and I've seen other people do it. And you notice my tone when I get confrontational actually gets quieter. And I kind of just pull back and become uh, really solid in myself with a lot of conviction, but not with a lot of yelling. What that'll do is sure. Maybe that will riff me and him, but it doesn't sound like that conversation is going well anyway. The people around me, though, there's a lot of respect to be gained for standing up for something, and especially when it's something you feel strongly about. So, like, taking this example aside, people that make jokes you find inappropriate, right? There's a lot of people who will bite their tongue if you'll make, like, really inappropriate jokes. And I'm not all for I mean, dude, I'm, you know, I'm a huge goof, so I'm all for humor, but... When people say things that's like, I think are really offensive and inappropriate, I'll just be like, whoa, dude, like, just ease up on that. And I'm not getting aggressive about it, but I don't shy from that because there's a sense of this guy has integrity, this guy says what he thinks, this guy stands up for what he believes that lasts and like very quickly will make a strong impression on people if you do it in a way that is very respectful and polite of other people. And this isn't something that you go like looking for. It's not like I constantly hunt down opportunities to do this it's about not biting your tongue when you do have something you're embarrassed about reveal that flaw when you do have something you disagree with so i actually think that you know raising your hand saying hey actually there's this hormonal thing and it's awesome is totally reasonable thing to do you think that like i know for example mark manson who we're both familiar with he suggests more or less like biting your tongue until prod where it's like if your view is challenged, then you, you need to stay on your ground. But like, if your view is completely contrary, like sometimes you're best off just like not really saying anything and just doing, you know, just keeping your mouth shut. If it's not contributory to the conversation. Yeah. What are your thoughts so, on that? So Mark and I've had, we've talked about this. I really, I like Mark. He, uh, he and I would both agree. This is like delicate shades of gray. This is not black and white. There is no hard and fast rule. I don't think either of us would say. What I would say is it depends on what is said, what your involvement is. I know this is a really soft, squishy answer, but like, that's the truth. But it is so, the truth. For instance, like you're a really strong theist or you're a really strong atheist and you hear somebody say something of a different belief, or you're a really strong Christian and somebody who's Jewish says something like you don't have an obligation to go immediately down that person's throat. Cause I said, that'll help you make a good impression. What it's about is if somebody around you, like, let's say you are one of those things and someone around you says that that thing is really stupid. You could bite your tongue because they're not addressing you, right? But I think you'd be better served with that person and every other person in earshot if you were to go, actually, I am that thing that you think is stupid and here are my beliefs on it. And if you don't want to engage on a conversation about it, you don't have to make it long. I tend to avoid politics and religion uh, as a rule these days, but it's about like not biting your tongue when someone says something that you vehemently disagree with because you're worried about your impression. You have to deliver it the right way. I highly recommend everyone read How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie for like how to do this stuff well. But it's actually really not a good way 
to make a strong impression on someone to just agree with everything they say, right? We've all had people like this, like you, your relationship with Noah, right? Is stronger because you didn't just come in and say, yes, everything you think in, is wonderful and you're superhuman and I'm honored to be in your presence, right? You like acted like a person, you acted like you would with good friends and I, the same way that I wouldn't jump down a friend's throat all the time, but also like, you know, if I disagree with something strongly enough and I think it's not okay to let it sit, I'll say something. It's that kind of attitude. And it doesn't happen often, but there are these moments where it can be really powerful to just say, eh, you know what? Like, I don't agree with that. And it's not going to be the meat of what makes the person like you, but it's a, just a, a powerful component of what's going to make that first impression. Yeah. You know, it's so funny, man. You just bring up a very specific instance where I was like a total agree everything fanboy and like ultimately didn't get the relationship I wanted. And I'm happy to talk about it. Basically I was, uh, this was when I was just getting into online marketing and I was like, yeah, I want to like build this massive like content empire and, you know, be online course, man. And I went out with, uh, my buddy, and my buddy Anik, and then he brought Ramit Sethi, who's the, mm. the founder of I Will Teach You Rich. Like, this guy's got you know a massive empire of however many millions uh, with his ideas and content, which is really cool. And I just remember being like, "Oh my god, like, dude, I love your stuff. Like, <laughs> oh my god, I have your app. Check it out. Like, pull out my phone." Yeah. And I remember him just being like super nice about the whole thing, but. I felt like I was like such an agreed everything fan and then like a fanboy that yep. I took myself out of the peer bucket yep. and into the like this dude's annoying bucket. And mm-hmm. it's just like a lesson that I'll I will have always remembered. Um where I like I could be a huge fan of somebody, I could love what somebody does, like, but like being overly agreeing and all that stuff and like treating people like that is treating people, how you treat people is usually like the bucket that you're going to get put in. If you treat somebody like a bro, like your friend, or maybe like one of your best girlfriends or whatever, like they're going to feel, they're going to put you in that bucket. If you treat somebody like, you know, a a lifelong fan or maybe even an enemy or whatever, like that's probably the bucket you're going to get put in. So just be like keenly aware of that, um, which is a huge learning lesson for me. Yeah. I have two examples. I have one response to that, I guess. And then one example from my own life for where this does come into play a lot. Cause the truth is like, you're not often going to get in screaming mashes about your theology and when you just meet someone, but two times it does come up. So one, you being a yes, a, a fanboy to Ramit, right? What if instead Ramit had been talking about what he does, right? And he had said something about maybe, oh, like Facebook's u- useless for building uh, following. It's all about email. Or he had said, oh, like investing in the stock market is how you make money and it's not about, you know, cutting costs. And you had an intelligent, well thought out, counter. And he said, it's all about email. And you said, actually, Facebook is doing this, 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 and this. And like, they're going to therefore be a great way to build if you do it this way. Or he says, oh, it's all about investing in commodities. Stocks are a joke. And you go, actually, stock, 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 something, something. If it's, if it's thoughtful and it's smart and you actually get him to go, huh. And for a second, even just consider that as an alternative before he goes, no, I don't think that's right. Even if you don't change his mind, he will, he will trust you to not be a fanboy and he'll put you in the bucket of something else, potentially peer, and he'll respect you because you have a thoughtful argument that one, you voiced it at all, and two, it's well thought out, it's well reasoned, right? So like for my own life, I used to be in, a, in another world, I was uh, in, on Wall Street, right? And I did a lot of recruiting and I was recruiting for investing jobs. And I remember one of my buddies was recruiting for a hedge fund and he went in and he met with like the head of the hedge fund or whatever. And they're talking about his idea. And he says, you know, cause in, you have to pitch a stock to buy most hedge funds to get a job. So he pitches the stock and the guy goes, I think this is a crap idea because of this. Most of us would go, Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Like I'll have to look at it. Or they'd go, Hmm, you know, like I will, you know, I respect your opinion. And he was like, no, that's wrong. And here's why, because blah, 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 blah. Guess who got the job out of the 30 people that interviewed for that one slot? It was that guy. It was the guy that said, no, I don't agree with you. Here's why. And then gave a real answer that convinced the guy that was in the chair. Wow. He's researched it. He's thoughtful. And I actually could see that. Maybe that's not true. Maybe I don't agree, 
but I could see that being true, true enough that like, I'm willing to now go back and research it myself before disagreeing further. That's huge because that's a guy that never gets disagreed with. Yeah, man, that's a, that's a cool story and just so on point. So yeah, that's really, that's, that's the, the opportunity that you've got, right? When it's something you're both thoughtful about and you can do it in a way that's not going to create rifts, but instead is going to make the other person go, wow, this guy actually might be a good guy to kick around ideas about, you know? Yeah, you know, we could all use more idea kicker rounders. <laughs> um, so I know we're short on time, so I'm going to do the rest of respect really short, and then we can go into the last component, which is actually making them feel good about themselves. Uh, dude, but, you got, you got, I actually just pushed back the next thing. So you got, uh, you got 15 minutes, man, to just oh, drop insane knowledge like you've been doing. Swimming in time. Boom. So, <laughs> all right. So, so you're in a conversation, right? You walk up, you smile, hello, blah, blah. You touch, your body language is great. Positive feelings and trust. You're not going out of the park in two minutes, right? There's no disagreements so far. So it's literally just all about your eye contact, your body language, touching, smiling. Now you're into the conversational meet, right? You're past the, hey, like, nice to meet you. And they go with something crazy, like, what do you do? Or where are you from? I've never right? heard that. Some, some wacky curveball they throw you, right? Uh, this is where like the meat of the, what do I say comes in? I'm not a big fan of scripting conversation. I'm not a big fan of like having a million flashcards in your head. Although like one or two is not bad of kind of like, how do I have this whole thing called human interaction go well, but it's about building habits. And so the 80, 20 of conversation is right here. in what I call reflex questions, which is to say this, think of the last 10 times you met someone new going to be from all walks of life. What did they ask you in the first 10 minutes, right? Oftentimes it's, what do you do? Where'd you go to school? Where are you from? Potentially how old are you? But you know what they are, right? Thinking and listening to this now, you know what they are. How do you answer those? I'll tell you how I used to answer those. Where are you from? Philadelphia. What do you do? I own a business. Okay. Uh, how old are you? 27. All right. And then it's my turn to go on the interview, right? What about you? What do you do? Uh, I'm in private equity. Where are you from? I'm from the Midwest. This conversation sucks. <laughs> like, yeah, it's totally just terrible. And we've all been through it and we do it over and over and over again. We never think about how can I make this better? These reflex questions, you know, you're going to get asked them. And what I would suggest to everybody listening to do is spend a handful of minutes. Think of the three you always get asked and come up with two answers. One that is funny that amuses you. And it's just meant to be fun. And one that is real, but that actually conveys something about you, that conveys your values, right? So it's not about having a longer answer. Like the correct answer wouldn't be, where are you from? Oh, I grew up in Philadelphia, but then I went to college in Philadelphia. Then I was in New York for a bunch of time. Then I was in Brazil for a while. And now I'm in Las Vegas. It's more interesting, but it's still just the what, right? It's like my resume. Yeah, what you totally. want to say is why, right? I was born in the Northeast and I lived there for a very long time, but eventually I decided to leave because it's just not the right place for me. The values of that area don't align with mine. I like warm weather. I like people that are gregarious, that laugh loud, that are friendly. And I wasn't finding that in Philadelphia or in New York. So I left and I moved to Brazil because that's where people are like that. They live for fun. Their values are right. It's not all about work. And I just found I connected much better with that set of values for me in that community. That's an answer that actually shares why it shares who you are at your core beyond your resume and it's not about rambling you want to keep it tight I've, I've given this advice to people when they come back with three paragraph essays it's just about conveying something interesting about yourself and conveying what's important to you which just from that one answer you know i like warm weather i probably like outdoor activity i like loud gregarious fun people and i'm willing to move cities to be around the people i like so obviously that part of my life is very important to me and then when you really nail it is when you leave open loops too, right? So you can say I was say just like, going to say, you've just created a bunch of open loops, which is money too. Yeah. And you could do even more, right? You could say, oh, I was in the Northeast for a while, but I left because that I decided that that culture is not really a good fit for me. And I moved to Brazil where I really like it because blah, 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 blah. And then they can ask the very obvious questions of what don't you like? What do you do that you can move around? What do you like about Brazil? Now you have an interactive dynamic conversation where an interview once was... And now you're riffing on stuff that's important to you, right? 
So he goes, oh, like, why do you like cold weather? I go, oh, I really like outdoor activity. I really like surfing. I really like MMA. He goes, oh, my God. Like, and then you can talk about that, right? It's not just about finding commonalities, but the truth is you're littering the conversational field with ammo, basically. And you're giving the person you're talking to a bunch of different stuff so that they can kind of choose their own adventure and pick up whatever they want. So they can ask me, what did I do in New York? They can ask me why I left. Whatever they care about, they're immediately going to be more interested because they're kind of driving the direction. And I'm happy to talk about whatever it is. And then same thing with when I'm asking questions, right? I say, what do you do? He goes, oh, I'm a stockbroker. I'll just go, oh, that's cool. Or I go, oh, my uncle's a stockbroker. Like, no, that's not a good answer. You go like, oh, that's cool. Why did you decide to be a stockbroker? Or what do you like about being a stockbroker? So when they say their answer, ask them why or what do they like? You want to get them talking about stuff that makes them feel good. So you wouldn't want to be like, oh, stockbroker, like that's got to be stressful and have them start thinking about and focusing on what stresses them out. Have them focus on what they like. And so if you just have fun answers, so jokes, literally how old are you? You can say like a ridiculous age. What do you do? Uh, tricycle, speed racing, rider, a hopscotch champion, whatever it is, like just a joke. And then a real answer that is conveying something about you. And then when you're, it's your turn to ask the questions, right? Follow up with why or what do you like? Now you have a dynamic, interesting conversation that will not run out of things to say right now you never have to worry about that awkward stall of conversation and you know you're conveying the things about yourself that you want and so whoever is on the other end of that conversation is immediately learning a ton about you enjoying the conversation and it's flowing right and so now like that's that's how you really nail the the respect bucket so to speak and you just have them really like you and respect you and know what you're about in a very short period of time without it feeling forced right I really like the one too that's like instead of saying like so where are you from or whatever like give them opportunities to tell stories and tell them about themselves and you really have to like hold their hand so it's like so like how did you end up in San Diego or like so yeah. like how the heck are you at this con how the heck are you at this conference like how'd you find yourself here and just like give them you know instead of just asking the question directly like give them a chance to kind of tell a little bit of story where they can display more about themselves Totally. Yeah, it's huge. People love to talk about themselves. And when you, especially when you start asking why, that's like, so you're in San Diego right now, right? Scott, you meet someone at a bar. You go, so why are you in San Diego? Like they immediately can talk ad nauseum about whatever, you know, life experiences they had that led them there. They're going to love that. And it's like a very easy opportunity for them to talk about whatever it is they want. And it starts to get them to open up too. And I'm telling you, there's like a bit of you give an interesting answer instead of a one word answer. Then you ask an interesting question. They'll give a long answer because you kind of just did. Then they'll ask you a more interesting question because you, and then all of a sudden it's like, you're building a stack on top of each other. And now you're just killing it. You're connecting and 10 minutes later, you're like, I love this person. And it's very, very fast, but it's just all about getting those reflex questions and like knowing how to handle them because you know they're coming. Yeah, total softballs. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about make, leaving the person, making them feel good because um, that's yep. huge too. Yeah. So that's the, that's, if you just do come in, create positive feelings, create trust, create respect, though they will like you, right? When you then after that, it's all sequential. When after they decided they like you, they trust you, they respect you, you're a good person. They're excited to have met you. Then you make them feel special and you make them feel good. Now they just love you. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So, so how do you do that? Right. So the one way to do it is the asking the questions like we just talked about. Other stuff, remember their name. People screw this up all the time. And it is like hugely important. If you meet somebody once and then you see them a week later and you say hi and then you say their name and you smile and you got your eye contact good, right? It's like all the stuff we talked about. You go, oh, hey, what's up, Scott? And you, you only talk to the guy for like 15 minutes and he had already made a good impression on you, now you're like, oh, I love that guy. People love their own name. So remember, remember their name. Uh, another one, look at them while they speak. I don't know if you've ever had this because you're such an interesting guy, but I have had in uh, my life where I'm talking and the person I'm talking to is looking around, kind of looking for someone else to talk to. And it's the single most dismissive thing that you can do basically. And it kills, you can come in hot fire, right? Smile, energy, eye contact, it's all killing it. And then he starts to talk 
and you start to look away, right? You're just, you've just killed like half of what you've done. So look at them when they speak. Uh, similarly to that, no phone. Like even mm. if your phone vibrates, let's say we're in a group of four, right? And I'm talking and all of a sudden it's your turn to talk and you're not necessarily talking to me, but you're talking to the group. And as soon as I'm done talking, I check my phone. That it's like a very dismissive way to make you feel like I'm not listening. Even if I am, I can multitask, right? But how hard is it to just keep the phone in the pocket so you go to the bathroom and actually look at the person the entire time that they speak? Makes a big difference on how that person feels about you as the listener and as a person. So remember their name, look at them while they speak, no phone. The last thing is uh, you want to compliment them, but you want to compliment them on what they care about. Yes. So a lot of people, they hear this make them feel special thing and they go into that fanboy mode or they go into that people pleaser mode. Like, got it. Nod and whatever they say, say it's amazing. So someone's like, oh yeah, I, you know, I work as an accountant. And you're like, that's awesome. And they're like, why is that awesome? And you're like, I don't know. Just thought it was awesome that you're an accountant. Like that's hollow. And people are really good at sensing when you're being disingenuous. Now, if you happen to think accounting is awesome, then go nuts there. But that's the point is like, Compliment them on something that's real that you're actually impressed by and that they care about. So if they're somebody that doesn't care about the thing you're complimenting, then it's going to fall flat. So if they're somebody that was born in a certain place or does a certain job, but they don't care about their job, even if you think a job, I had this all the time when I was working in investment banking. I'd be like, I'm an investment banker and like college kids who were at networking events to try to get jobs would be like, oh my God, like you work at that firm. That's awesome. It's like, yeah, I guess. But like, but if it had been something that really mattered to the listener, then all of a sudden that compliment rings way more true. And I'm sure everyone can think of a time when someone complimented you on something that you don't often hear and that is important to you, how good that makes you feel, right? How do you, how do you pick out that particular attribute that somebody might not get a lot? Yeah, so you just read them. So I mean, it's I, not, so in terms of not getting it a lot, that's like, just avoid the, just avoid the obvious stuff. Right. So like, if you're talking to somebody and you think they always get complimented for the same thing, like try to dig for at least one layer deeper. You know what I mean? Uh, so for instance, like you're talking to somebody who played football and they're like, Oh yeah, I played football. And you're like, football is awesome. Or you can be like, Oh, you play football. Like, tell me about that. And I met this guy. He has like the NCAA record for tackles in a single season. Right. And if you dig to that level, you're like, oh, like you play football. And he's like, yeah, that's cool. Like, oh, we're getting good. And he's like, oh, well, you know, I was actually, I was pretty good. I did this. And then, you, and then all of a sudden he gets to that thing and you're like, dude, that's amazing. Like one, it's more genuine from my point of view. Two, you've like spent just a little bit of time to dig into his story to find the specifics, you know? So another thing, like if you go up to Richard Branson and you're like, I'm so impressed by how rich you are. He's not, that's like not going to blow his socks off. Right. But if you have taken the time to learn his story in person or you know it ahead of time, but you pick something he actually cares about, right? You're like, I got to say, like what you're doing with SpaceX is so amazing because, and then I don't know much about SpaceX, but insert well thought answer that people who care about astronauts and SpaceX would find interesting. Like that's because he obviously is a passion about that, right? He started it. If you can go in that level and compliment him on that, which you might actually care about, have a passion about much more likely that he'll stop and give you 30 seconds of his time. Yeah, man, that's so good, man. And it's so true. Like, you know, when people say particular things to me that I don't hear a lot, I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that about myself. This is amazing. Like it's, it's a superpower, man. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, when people, it's, it's a little thing, but like people will apply for coaching, right? And like, we ask them to fill out an application because we screen them. And a lot of people just fill out like me, 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 me. But every once in a while, someone will write in and be like, yeah, and like, for instance, I read this article that you and Charlie wrote, and I really, it hit home, and since then, I've been blah, blah, blah. Or like, that's why I decided to start following you guys. And I'm like, I take a lot of pride in the stuff we write. Like, we spend a lot of time editing that stuff most of the time. And it's like, very much more impactful to know that that person has read that specific piece of work and likes it than if they're just like, I love your blog. So it's just about going to that one level deeper, or it's about picking that thing that they don't hear a lot that you really mean. And when you have both those elements of you really mean it, and it's probably something that person cares about, then 
it'll hit home much harder. And if you combine that with remembering your name, looking at them when they speak, not having your phone out, being really engaged, then you'll make them feel like you actually care, like they're actually special. So when you tie it all together, right, you've already made them like you, they trust you, they respect you, you're fun, you're someone that they admire as a thought partner, and then they feel like you really get them, they feel like you really understand what's going on in their head also. Even if that only took 15 minutes, that's someone that you'll be able to meet up with anytime you're in the same city, ping for a job, collaborate with, right? So you can kind of see how when they're all there, how it can be a very powerful combination. And it's kind of honestly easy to tie them all together. Such amazing advice, man. I think this is the, the framework for creating great impressions. So tell me, man, if people want more information about you, about all the stuff that you teach, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, yeah, sure. Honestly, the best place to go is just www.charismaoncommand.com slash newsletter. And if you just sign up there, that's, that'll get you all of our best stuff. That gets you all our best free content. And that's the best place for anyone to start who's interested in this kind of stuff and kind of wants to learn the rest, right? So like once you have a good first impression, how do you captivate people when you speak? How do you tell stories? All that blah, blah, blah. Like that's the best place for people to go if they're not been exposed to us before. Amazing, dude. Thank you so much for coming on today, man. You absolutely rocked it. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I love this stuff. Before we finish up with today's Mindshare, I just want to say thanks for listening to another episode of The Competitive Edge. If you enjoyed the ideas in this episode and want access to future conversations, the best thing you can do is subscribe to The Competitive Edge on iTunes. If you haven't done that already, right now is the best time to take care of that and get on board. And while you're there, if you feel like this show has made a positive impact on your day, it'd be great if you could leave us an iTunes review so that more people can find the show. Now, I know we covered a lot in this episode, and there might be a few key ideas or tools that you want to remember. So we went ahead and compiled all of the notes and links mentioned from this conversation for you on lifelonglearner.com. That's life-longlearner.com. Alrighty, let's go ahead and dive into today's Mindshare. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode with one of my best friends and former roommates, Ben Altman. Certainly just the guy knows his stuff when it comes to people, man. And it's truly amazing when you learn and study this stuff and practice it with intention, what it can do for your life. Today, I thought I would just in this mindshare segment, give a few tips and phrases that I've used that I, that I feel are very strong for leaving people feeling good after you meet them. And how I came about these is I noticed people said these into my said these to me in my life, and I was just like, "Wow, that feels so amazing and powerful." And I just left with such a positive emotion in coming out of that particular experience that I wrote it down and tried to make it a habit of saying it in my own life. So the first one is actually one that I got from former competitive edge guest Ted Allen. After we spoke on the interview, he said, "Man, dude, I'm so excited." we're going to be friends for life. And that to me was just such a powerful phrase that when you have congruence and when it's actually true, it's the only time you ever want to say things like this. You never want to lie. You always want to be integrous. That phrase was so strong to me. And so I was like, Hey, look forward to talking soon. Like, man, we're going to be friends for life. It was so powerful. And I still, to this day, just have such amazing feelings for Ted. I want the world for him. I want total abundance for him in his life. And I think one of the reasons why it made such a powerful first impression on me and why I still tell people to listen to his episode as probably the number one on competitive edge is because he made me feel incredibly good by saying things like that during the episode. So we're going to be friends for life is an excellent thing to say. Another one that I really like is after you meet somebody event, when you're, you're parting ways, is just saying, Hey, I just want to let you know, I'm so excited. We met, I'm really excited that we had a chance to meet any permutation of that. And for me, like that, that type of thing is just something I don't hear a lot when it's said to me, it signals confidence. It signals that there's this high potential upside for the future, that our relationship is going to move mountains together. And it's just, it just leaves you feeling good. 
So I really like, I'm really excited that we met. And another one that I wanted to share that my friend Dane Maxwell um, originally said to me that really stuck with me uh, when I was on this trip with Mancation. And we were saying goodbye and he's like, hey dude, I just want to let you know, um, I really look forward that I'm really glad we met and I'll, and I'll be thinking of you, man. And I'm, I'm going to be keeping you in my thoughts. And that was just a really amazing amazing way to just end an interaction and it made me feel like he really cared and i know he cares we're friends today and there's almost just this sense of like this is not going to be just this interaction this is going to be you're going to be somebody that i'm going to be looking out for i'm going to be watching over you i'm going to be trying to really just seek out opportunities to make your life better and boy what an amazing compliment one amazing thing that you can say to someone so these three particular phrases are ones that I particular that I really like to exercise at the end of interactions where I feel this way about this particular person and I want to make them feel good. And just to repeat, they are, we're going to be friends for life. I'm really excited we met and I'll be thinking of you. And you say these things to somebody, you don't hear it very often. And man, it makes them feel special. At least it certainly does for me. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode with Ben. I highly recommend checking out some of the amazing other episodes we have on social skills on the competitive edge. This is something you're trying to improve. And I look forward to seeing you on the next show.